in 2005 to 2006, um, the AOMB manager, Linda Nunn and I, were talking about how we could really demonstrate to people, rather than just telling people about the landscape, actually demonstrate it. And what we wanted to find was some way in which we could have some big event that would that would attract people in in a location where we could we could actually show people how a landscape works and not just what it looks like the people who make it work the people who own it the people who work in the woodlands who work on the farms and actually how all the different components that make up landscape fit together and in 2000 late 2006 um, uh, we came upon the idea of a wood fair and so we put that together and in October 2007 we, we held the first event, a two day event here at the Llama Tree Gardens um, and, and it's a fantastic location and it seems to have worked so this is the third, the third time we've run it, we run it every two years. We have lots of crafts lots of woodworkers but also what we try and do is is mix the, the sort of traditional woodland trades and woodland crafts like wood turning and bodging and tool making and chair making and things like that which are perhaps quite old-fashioned we try to mix that with absolutely modern quite literally cutting edge technologies C16A, it's the first of its kind in the UK. It's um, a coppicing machine which um, cuts off the stems of the coppice in unmanaged woodland. Um, it can take up to two to three trees at a time and stack them in one place. The um, circular saw um, encourages good regrowth so that the unmanaged woodland can be better managed and um, better looked after in. Once it's cut, it's extracted to roadside um, where our larger chip comes in and then it chips it and then it goes off um, to be seasoned and is used for biomass boilers so it, it completes a, the whole circuit to reduce carbon emissions in the UK. There are thousands and thousands of hectares of unmanaged woodland and this machine hopefully can encourage people to better manage their woodlands. What is the landscape of Cranbourne Toast? What makes it special? What really makes it special is one of the major themes of this year's Wood Fair, which is the history that lies behind it. And, <clears throat> and that is really unique. Cranbourne Chase was a chase. It was a royal forest preserved for hunting deer and wild boar. And that came about officially from about... Um, uh, the late 1080s, so we have some historical reenactors here who um, are reliving the year 1086, which is sort of doomsday book year, where um, where the Normans are coming to Cranbourne Chase and a mythical village that we've invented for the weekend called Larmawick um, to raise taxes and to impose forest law. On the Saxon people. This is a Viking star boat. They would have called it a probably called it a tearing, a ten oared boat. Um, built in the Viking style, which is clinker built, so you start off with laying a keel down on the floor, um, and then you build the shell of the boat up around from the keel and then you put the framework in right at the very end and all the planks are overlapped um, so it's one of the reasons it's sometimes called a clench built boat because you actually clench everything together um, or with the uh, with the nails and yeah it's the, it's the kind of boat that will probably have been used by uh, a merchant doing coastal sailing uh, a fisherman maybe if, if you're a 
offshore, you know, with a, with a few islands. You, you've got sheep or something like that on the island. You'd be using it for, to basically, you know, a farm boat is what they call it in, in Norway. Uh, somebody else said that it's very much the Ford Transit of the Viking Age. It's big enough to carry small cargoes. So it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a really useful boat. It's a really nice boat to sail as well. Back in the day, during the harsh times, midwinter, when our flour supplies and our grain supplies had diminished, we had loads of acorns. So we found out that if we took the acorns, ground them into a paste, placed them in a sack, bleached them in the river so the toxins were washed away, we could dry them out and use them acorns as a flour to make a form of bread. Got us through the winter. I don't know where our servants have gone. They're, they should be should be around. I'm I'm the lady. This is my horse here, and um, hopefully they'll be here soon because I want them to help me mount up. So the servants have taken some time off. Okay? Apparently, yes. I don't know. Probably they're over there somewhere. I think having a chat to send send my lord over to sort them out. To a certain extent, in those days, those people would already have been familiar with the restrictions imposed by hunting because it was a Saxon royal hunting area in the Duchy of Gloucester. But the Normans were much more organised and they um, they ran England as a business and, and, and so what they wanted was taxes but they also wanted recreational areas, hunting forests and Cranbourne Chase was one of them. And so that history really started to uh, to put us on the tracks that we're on now, because people weren't allowed to settle here. There was forest law here until 1823, longer than anywhere else in England, and <clears throat> and so the land was managed here in a very peculiar way, very particular way, um, for for woodlands and for and um, for uh, for natural grasslands that could that could be good for big game like fallow deer. And so that's the landscape that we're seeing now. When you drive around Cranbourne Chase, that's actually what we see out the window. You see a Norman hunting forest. The future for Cranbourne Chase is um, uncertain, it has to be said, uh, and that's why it needs to be an area of outstanding natural beauty, that's why it needs to have some sort of protection, because it's going to change, all landscapes change, and we want it to change, it's got to change to adapt to a change in climate, it's got to adapt uh, urban farming to uh, as, as world markets change, we're going to have to produce different crops and different types of food and things like that. So there's going to be change, there's going to be economic growth and development. But what we mustn't lose is what the essential nature of the landscape is, the character of it. So in a hundred years time, when you drive or do whatever people are going to do instead of driving in a hundred years across Crampon Chase, you should still know that it's Crampon Chase. It will look different, but the character will still be there. And we need to make sure that is preserved for the generations that come after us.